today. So I'm going to be talking about energy harvesting from anisotropic fluctuations. And this is a joint work with Amir Tawai, Rui Fu, Yongxin Chen, and Trifon George. So before I start, let me uh, give a couple words in the title. So the first part, energy harvesting, hopefully everyone knows what I mean by this. So I'm going to harvest energy from stochastic thermodynamic system. But this is not going to be your uh, typical sort of Cardinal cycle or Stirling cycle. Uh, in the setting, we're going to be extracting work from anisotropic fluctuations. So what do I mean by anisotropic fluctuations? What I mean by anisotropic fluctuations is that the different degrees of freedom of my stochastic thermodynamic system are going to be subjected to different fluctuations. There's different temperature, different noise amplitudes. Now, the reason and the motivation to study this type of systems is because they are really ubiquitous in this uh, as energy harvesting mechanisms, but also in biological systems. So, for example, here we have the very famous Feynman stretches. So this is an autonomous engine that's able to sort of extract work from the system by a, um, lifting some weight. So this is due to the asymmetry in these two wheels and these two wheels being immersed in these two different temperature heat paths. So far from going into the details of the system, I just want to say that we can think of the system as having two de different degrees of freedom, each of which is sub subjected to a different temperature. And therefore in this sort of setting of anisotropic fluctuations. On the other hand, we also have a myriad of uh, proteins that really live across our membranes inside our bodies. So this is an example, the ATP synthase. This is a molecular motor that really uh, synthesizes ATP by using an ion concentration gradient. So we have this the membrane here in, in uh, yellow. And on one side of the membrane, we have a high concentration of hydrogen, hydrogen ions. And on the other side of the membrane, we have a low concentration of hydrogen ions. So again, the system is extremely complex and not well understood. But I just want to point to the fact that very simplistically, we can think of it as having two subunits. The upper subunit is immersed in this heat bath, which is in this environment, which has a lot of bombardment coming from these uh, high concentration of hydrogen ions, while the lower subunit, which is somehow coupled, is immersed in this environment in which there's low bombardment from these particles. And therefore, we can think of this system again as uh, having two degrees of freedom uh, subject to different amplitude in the fluctuations. So, but again, uh, I mean, the scope of my talk will be sort of more simple than this. These are very complex mechanisms. So what I, will, what I will be focusing on is more simple systems and symmetric systems, such as the one uh, portrayed by the Brownian gyrator system. So the Brownian gyrator was introduced by Fulger and Rayman in 2007. And what they thought of is they thought of one particle that is able to move in two dimensions. So in one dimension, it will jitter a lot due to this hot temperature, while in the other dimension, it won't jitter that much due to a cold temperature. And this particle is sort of kept in place by this potential, which in this case is quadratic and makes the dynamics linear. So these same dynamics are also able to model uh, the dynamics of this circuit, and in particular, the charges at these two different capacitor plates and how these charges evolve in time. So these charges will again fluctuate due to these two different resistors being subjected to different temperatures. And therefore giving rise to this Nyquist-Johnson fluctuating currents that makes these two degrees of freedom, these two charges also in the setting of these anisotropic fluctuations. So one of the reasons this system has been so widely studied, both sort of theoretically and experimentally, is because of its simplicity. Um, the linear dynamics makes it analytically solvable, so we know a lot of things about this system. But the other reason it has been so widely studied is because it displays what we call non-equilibrium steady states. So we have already seen a couple of things about non-equilibrium steady states, but just me, let me give the basics. So essentially, we have our thermodynamic system, and we're going to leave it by itself, so we're gonna, not going to change anything. And it will it will eventually um, reach a steady state, so a state that won't change in time. But the steady state will be very particular because it will be a state that's not at equilibrium. In this case, we would have, for example, swirling particles around the origin. The swirling motion doesn't change the overall sort of state of the system, so we're still at steady state, but it mediates heat transference between these two heat baths, therefore driving the system far away from equilibrium because we have this constant entropy production at the environment. So the motivation to study this non-equilibrium steady states and the reason we are so interested in them is because they're really a signature of life, because life by necessity operates far away from equilibrium. It's characterized by this order and this complexity that cannot really be found at this equilibrium state, the state of maximum entropy, maximum disorder. 
So this is a very broad sort of motivation of the study of this type of system subject to anisotropic fluctuations. Let me actually go to the object of my talk. So I will talk, I will split the talk into different parts. The first part will be uh, sort of basic some stochastic dynamics. So we'll forget about anisotropic fluctuations. We'll simply consider a one dimensional system with one temperature, which in particular will be overdumped. So what I will try to do is sort of um, make sure that everyone's in the same page on the notation. And moreover, I will try to draw this uh, sort of relationship between stochastic thermodynamics and a field of mathematics known as optimal mass transport. This, this relationship between these two will give us a geometric view that will be extremely useful for the second part of the talk. So in the second part of the talk, I will be actually talking about these systems subjected to anisotropic fluctuations, and in particular, we'll try to extract energy from these systems, and through this sort of geometric picture, and we will show that the problem of maximizing work output is really related to an isoperimetric problem, while that of maximizing efficiency is related to an isoperimetric inequality. So let's get started. So throughout, I'm going to be considering this over Dan Van Javine equation. So essentially, I'm modeling the position of this Brownian particle with X. So here's my Brownian particle. This particle is immersed in a heat bath of smaller particles, the red ones. These red particles are at some temperature, and therefore they jitter, and they will, they will eventually bump into this Brownian particle. So this will exert some force on the Brownian particle. And this force is what's being modeled by this um, Gaussian like uh, white noise, uh, essentially this Brownian motion. So we have this particle at this heat path that is very viscous. So we're in this overdone setting. So really, this is the assumption that the inertial effects can be negligible in the time scales we are interested in. So the velocity degree, the degree of freedom really decays much faster than we're interested in. So it doesn't really hold any energy. And therefore, we can think of the system as the forces directly acting on this position. So the forces directly changing the position of my particle. So this will be uh, my, my sort of setup, my model for my thermodynamic system. So we have that the position of my particle changes due to two forces. One force comes from these thermal fluctuations, these red particles. It's proportional to this B, the Brownian motion, the square root of two times gamma, the friction coefficient of my heat bath, Kb, the Boltzmann constant, and T, the temperature of my heat bath. On the other hand, I will also be considering a potential forcing. So a forcing that comes from a potential function, the potential energy of this uh, Brownian particle. As such, it is really a function of its position, but it will, we will also take it to be a function of time. And this is because we will assume that we have external control over this potential energy of my Brownian particle. That's typically the case in some experimental setups. So we will really think of this T as not only time, but also our control parameter. So, okay, so again, this is a stochastic differential equation. As such, we can perform an experiment and we'll get one trajectory. If we perform the same experiment again, we'll get a different trajectory. So instead of looking at it at the level of a single uh, particle trajectory, we can look at its statistics. So the statistics, all the information is essentially inside this function, the probability density function, this row of T of X. What this row of T of X is telling us is what's the probability of finding a particle at position X at time T. So this probability density, uh, because we have this type of model, now evolves according to this pocket flank equation, we have, which we have written here as a continuity equation. This means that really the mass of rho is conserved over time, so the integral of rho over dx is really always equal to one, which makes it a reasonable sort of probability distribution. So in order to write it in this continuity form, we have defined this mean velocity field, this uh, B of T of X, which is minus one over gamma times the gradient of U plus KBT times the gradient of the logarithm of rho. So now again, uh, sort of with this very brief uh, sort of introduction, uh, what I'm trying to say is we have a dynamics at two different levels. At one level, we have dynamics of single particle trajectories. And at the other level, we have the ensemble dynamics. So with these dynamics, let me now go into the energetics in order to actually do some thermodynamics. So the energy of a single particle, as I sort of hinted at in this overdone setting, is simply given by its potential energy, because the kinetic energy really can be neglected in the setting. So let us take the differential of this energy, and we'll get two different terms. One that accounts from how u varies with respect to t, so partial u with respect to t dt, plus partial u with respect to x dx. This first term really takes into account how the energy varies through these controlled degrees of freedom in this sort of useful way. And this is why we'll call it the differential of work. On the other hand, the second term really takes into account how the energy varies through these sort of uncontrolled degrees of freedom, not directly controlled over, and uh, really counts for how the energy of heat. So these two different terms here are sort of fluctuating terms, random variables. So they really depend on each of the realizations. But 
as before, we can still have a picture at the level of an ensemble simply by taking the expected value. So we can take the expected value of each of these terms and also integrate over time. And we'll get to the work and the heat at the level of an ensemble over a time interval. So these are now sort of deterministic um, um, expressions. So using uh, doing the exact same thing sort of with the same with for the whole expression, we'll get to the first law at the level of an ensemble, which is simply stating mass conservation, sorry, energy conservation. So the energy of my system only changes either through work that is exchanged with the external potential or through heat that is exchanged with the heat map. So with this now, let me try to derive the second law, and this will be the last slide of my introduction. So the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of an isolated system always increases. So the entropy rate is always positive or at least non-negative. Now, my isolated system is now formed by this combined system of both the system of particles and the environment. So I really have to take both of them into account here. So the entropy rate of the system is given by the partial derivative with respect to T of minus KB times the integral of rho log rho, this just the entropy of my system. On the other hand, the entropy rate at the level of the environment is given by this sort of classical um, expression because the environments seem to be at equilibrium. So it's minus the heat rate divided by the temperature. Now, putting these two terms together, summing them up, really playing around with them and integrating over time, we'll get to the following expression for the total entropy production over a time interval. So we're going from one probability distribution to another probability distribution in some time TF. So we're going through some path uh, in this sort of space that I will now call the space of thermodynamic states, the space of probability distributions. So the total entropy production, we can quantify it as this constant and uh, times this integral over time of the expected value of the square norm of the velocity. So in particular, this is always positive and this really constitutes the standard second law. But of course, in the setting of stochastic thermodynamics, we can do better than this and we can have a finite time correction to this. And a way to do so is through optimal mass transport. So this branch of mathematics has been really studied for almost 300 years, and its goal and its sort of object is to study this uh, optimization problem. So the goal is to minimize this sort of action integral, so an integral over time of this kinetic energy of the particles that flow according to this continuity equation from an initial probability or mass distribution to a final probability or mass distribution. So what optimal mass transport tells us is that the solution to this problem exists, it's unique, and it's given by the square of a distance, in particular, the fascist time to a distance between the two endpoint distributions, rho zero and rho tf. So now by noting that really this cost is nothing but a constant times this total entropy production, we can really use this optimal mass transport theory to have this tighter bound on efficiency. And in particular, we still have this constant, we have one over TF and this square of the distance. So if TF goes to infinity, of course, we, we recover the standard second law, but if TF is finite and if rho zero and rho TF are different to each other, they are not exactly identical, then we have that this term is always positive. So we really have this finite time correction to the second law that is on top of that always achievable. So optimal mass transport also tells us what is the optimal path, the optimal rho of T that goes from rho zero to rho T F and the velocity to achieve this. So of the control that you need to achieve this. So this framework is really extremely useful in this problem of minimizing entropy production. But it's not only useful in this problem, but it also gives us a way to sort of metrize the space of thermodynamic states. So now let me think of my space of thermodynamic states as this space of probability distributions. So this Vash's time to distance, what's really telling me is that we can really measure distances in this between two probability distributions in the space of uh, uh, probability distributions. And we can not only do so, but we can also measure lengths of given paths. And this will be extremely useful in the second part of my talk. And this will really give us a geometric view that will help us solve this problem of harvesting energy from anisotropic fluctuations. So now in the second part of my talk, let me consider n-dimensional system. And now each of the degrees of freedom is going to sub be subjected to a different temperature. So therefore in the setting now of anisotropic fluctuations. So in particular, I'll have the same exact overdone band dynamics, but now the X lives in Rn and T is a matrix that is uh, N times N and it's diagonal with unequal entries to the work extraction and to have this anisotropic fluctuations. So again, each of the degrees of freedom here are really subjected to a different temperature. So my goal in the stock will be to find the optimal control U that maximizes work extraction from the system while driving the system over a cycle. 
So because we are, we are going over a cycle, really uh, we start and we end at the same state, and therefore the energy over a cycle of my of my thermodynamic system doesn't really change. So the en energy over a cycle is zero, which means by the first law that really the work output, which is minus the work because of the sign convention I've chosen, is really equal to the heat. So for us, it will be more convenient to focus on quantifying this total heat over a cycle. So this is what we will do. So what we did is we got this definition for the heat rate that we had a couple of slides ago. We played around with it and we wrote it in terms of V and rho only. So without the gradient of U. So we expressed the gradient of U in terms of rho and V. And we got these two different expressions. So this first expression is linear in the velocity, while the second expression is quadratic in the velocity. In fact, the second expression should by now be familiar because it's nothing but the cost that we were trying to minimize in this optimal mass transport problem. And as such, as Tf goes to infinity, then this term can always go to zero, and therefore we'll call it the dissipative heat. On the other hand, uh, we have this term that is linear in the velocity, and because of this, we can really interpret it as a line integral in the space of thermodynamic states. So as a line integral, it doesn't really depend on how fast we go along with this line, on how we parametrize it, but only on the shape of this line. And this is why we'll call this term the quasi-static heat. So, okay, so now let us go over a, a cycle. So in particular, we're gonna go over a cycle in the space of thermodynamic states. So this is an infinite dimensional uh, manifold and a cycle will simply represent a closed curve. Now, let me uh, sort of simplify and restrict myself to a two-dimensional submanifold. So now we'll look into a two-dimensional submanifold, uh, which is parametrized by this curve alpha. So a um, closed curve in this two-dimensional submanifold parametrized by lambda one and lambda two, these two degrees of freedom. And this curve will, will encircle a domain that we call D. So it's a closed curve. So why are we interested in this sort of very abstract setting? Well, the reason it's like it can be useful. Uh, so here's an example, and this is actually an example that I'm going, I'm going to go back to over and over again. And this is the setting of the Brownian gyrator. So here we have uh, essentially quadratic potential linear dynamics, which makes uh, our, our probability distributions Gaussian. In particular, here we'll have zero mean, and as a zero mean Gaussian, they can really be represented in terms of the covariance matrix. In this case, we have a two dimensional um, system. So the covariance matrix is a two by two symmetric metric. In this case, we're gonna simplify a little bit and parameterize it by R and theta. So theta will measure sort of the rotation of this metric, while R will measure the uh, relative magnitude of the two eigenvalues. So again, we'll have two degrees of freedom, sorry, two, yeah, two degrees of freedom, R and theta. So two parameters, R and theta, which uh, if you give me an R and you give me a theta, then I will give you a probability distribution. I will give you the state of my thermodynamic system. So, okay, so now let me zoom out and I'm actually going to go back to this example over and over again, but I will also sort of in parallel try to give you a more abstract uh, vision of this problem. So let me now zoom out. Let me write the quasi-static heat as we had it before as a line integral. Now, because we have a closed curve, it's going over the perimeter over of this um, domain. Because we have this finite dimensional parameterization, we can really use Stokes theorem to write this line integral as an area integral. So we can write this area integral in a very general way, but let's not focus on this sort of abstract uh, setting. And let me go back to our example. So in our example, we can really write this uh, quasi-static heat as this line integral. So it's clear it's an integral over the perimeter, something times dr plus something times d theta. Now we can explicitly use Stokes theorem to write it as an integral over the whole domain, over the area of some function that comes from Stokes theorem that we'll call the work density, times some sort of um, um, unit area. So let me plot this work density uh, here, color coded. Okay, here, color coded. So here, what I'm plotting is each of the points in this plane is really corresponds to a different R and theta, and therefore they really correspond to a different state of my thermodynamic uh, systems so with a different uh, probability distribution. So let me give you. So what we've learned is really that if we go along this particular cycle, you can uh, just an example in red. So what we found out is that the quasi-static heat is simply given by the integral of the area enclosed within this cycle, weighted by our work density that is here color-coded. So we found out the quasi-static heat, that the quasi-static work is nothing but an area integral over a work density. So let me now look at dissipation. So dissipation again can be in terms of this cost that we minimize in this setting. I don't know if there's a question. Um, so 
uh, because we it's the cost we know it's the cost and it's a problem we can really use this geometry uh, to lower bound this expression so for any given we'll be able to lower bound uh, this expression by some constant divided by tf the final time of my transition uh, times the length squared of the of this curve so the length squared of this given curve uh, this length measured in this flash is time to sense so what this is telling me is that if you give me any curve then i can give you through optimal mass transport the optimal parameterization that will minimize this quasi static this dissipation so okay so let us write this length in terms now of my two uh, parameters so we have it we can write it as an integral over this uh, perimeter of the norm of the velocity of the curve and this norm in the Wasserstein to sense so weighted by this Wasserstein metric gw so for our example this gw takes the following form so we have this metric which is a diagonal and it's also very simple because it's data independent so it's rotational symmetric and this will be extremely useful later so again, going back to our plot and to our example cycle, what we found out is that if we're going along the cycle, then minimum dissipation is really given by something proportional to the square of the length of this red curve and this length measured in this Wasserstein two sense. Okay, so let us put these two things together. And then we can write the work output as this difference between the weighted area here and the length squared. And this length squared is actually weighted by some parameter mu, which is this ratio between this characteristic time, which is constant for, uh, for our given system, and this time of my period, the time of my cycle. So our goal now is to find to, to maximize this work output. So to find the optimal cycle in the space of thermodynamic states that will actually uh, maximize this difference. So what we realized when we looked at this problem, so this problem is really related to an isoperimetric problem, which is that of maximizing an area integral with such that a length is fixed. So the isoperimetric problem has an extremely long history and sort of the canonical isoperimetric problem is that in Euclidean space and flat space. So we can think of it by grabbing our shoelace and trying to uh, close the curve of our shoelace. And then we can put the shoelace on top of our table and try to find the optimal shape of our shoelace that will maximize the area within it. So playing around with it, we will shortly find out that the optimal curve is, of course, a circle. So here we have the exact same problem, but instead of a flat space, we have a curved space. We have the space of thermodynamic states. And moreover, we also have weight areas. So unfortunately, the solution to our problems will no longer be just circles, but it will be a little bit more complex. So what we can do is we can write the first order in a specific condition for optimality. So a condition that has to be um, satisfied if our cycles are optimal. And this is the condition for optimality for this problem of maximizing work output. So through this condition, we can really understand this relationship uh, because we can really think of mu as either a parameter for this problem of maximizing work output or as a Lagrange multiplier for this problem of maximizing area such that the length is fixed. So they really share this first order necessary condition. So there, now, next, what we did is, okay, we couldn't solve uh, analytically in whole generality this expression. So what we did is we went back to our Brownian generator example, and we solved them numerically. So what we found are here the optimal curves that solve this isoperimetric problem So the, for different fixed lengths, so for smaller lengths and for larger lengths. And these are portrayed over this grid that exemplifies the work density, this WQS. So of course, the optimal curves are always trying to go over, the, over this point with maximum work density. Another way to understand this plot is through this sort of uh, relationship between these two problems is by, uh, instead of looking at different fixed lengths, looking at different fixed mu's. Because really, uh, high, the higher mu, the more penalty on this length squared, and therefore the smaller cy the cycles will be, the lower the mu, so this would be the lowest mu, we would have longer cycles. So again, let me be a little bit more explicit of how this solving this isoperimetric problem actually helps us uh, solve this problem of maximizing work output. And so here we have plotted the oh, optimal- Sorry, Olga, uh, just a brief uh, comment. You have five minutes, including, in theory, including questions, but I will okay. but yes, you finish in around five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'll have to skip some slides, but um, okay, so here we have numerically solved the isoperimetric problem. So these are the optimal areas for different fixed lengths. So here we have different fixed lengths. So the solution to this problem really helps us find the problem, the solution to the problem of maximizing work output, uh, because this is the maximum work output is simply the maximum vertical distance between this optimal isoperimetric line and the line with constant slope mu, because really the work output is, is related to this difference. 
But moreover, by solving this isoperimetric problem, we also have a solution to another problem for free, which is that of maximizing work output for a fixed efficiency. So I haven't defined efficiency yet, but I will do so very shortly. So just believe me, bear with me, that the points with constant efficiency will be located at a line in this plot. And therefore, the operating point for this problem of maximizing work output for a fixed efficiency will be simply located at this intersection. And the work output would then be given by this vertical distance. So, okay, so as I promised, let us now uh, take a look to efficiency. So efficiency can be defined for the system subject to anisotropic fluctuations as this ratio between the work output and the quasi-static work. And this really makes sense because the quasi-static work is the maximum amount of work that we, we, are, we are able to extract from any fixed curve if we're able to parameterize it in infinite time so if we can get rid of this equation. So of course, this means that the efficiency is always bounded by one by the second law. Now, our goal is going to be to try to find a tighter bound on efficiency and try to find a bound that takes into account the fact that we are working on finite time. In order to do this, we'll again use our sort of geometric tools. So let me write this efficiency in terms of my area and my length as one minus mu times this ratio between the length squared and the weighted area. What I will do now is I will use isoperimetric inequalities to bound this efficiency. So isoperimetric inequalities uh, really bound this ratio between the length squared and the area that is enclosed within any length in a given manifold. So they come in very different forms and very different shapes, and some of them might be tighter than others, depending on what physical setting we have, what model, what essentially what underlying space we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to exemplify how to use these uh, through our two-dimensional Brownian generator example. So in that example, if you remember, we had a rotationally symmetric metric, which means that we can use this particular isoperimetric inequality. Essentially, working out the details, we'll get that the length squared is always lower bounded by 2 pi times the area enclosed within it. Now this is an weighted area. Well, for efficiency here, we had weighted areas. So what we have to do is the following, we have to multiply and divide by the unweighted area, and then use the asymptotic inequality to bound this term. So here uh, we have defined this F bar, so which is the ratio between this unweighted area, sorry, this weighted and this unweighted area. And then, but this really still depends on the cycle we choose. So because we want this uh, bound on efficiency to be sort of universal and independent on the cycle, we will estimate this F bar by the maximum of F, which in this case is one half. So here we'll have our um, bound on efficiency that now is independent on the cycle and it has this finite time correction. So it's one minus four pi times to see this characteristic time divided by TF, the time period of my cycle. So not only do we have this finite time correction to efficiency that is independent of the cycle, but we also have a speed limit because if TF is smaller than four pi times TC, if we're going too fast, then this negative term will dominate over one. And therefore efficiency will always be negative no matter what cycle we choose, we're always going too fast. And what, what negative efficiency means is that we cannot extract any positive work. Okay, so with this, I was going to talk a little bit about non-conservative forcing. And um, we've shown how this problem of maximizing this uh, power output when we have control over non-conservative forcing at steady state is really related to an impedance matching problem in circuit theory. I'm not gonna go over the details. Um, I also want to point out that we can use this sort of um, problem that we try to solve of maximizing uh, work output through this potential forcing to really have design principles to design autonomous engines. And this is what we did uh, based on this electrical embodiment of the Brownian generator. In another work, again, I won't go into details. Let me just uh, sort of wrap up and summarize and hope that I've conveyed this idea that optimal mass transport can really be useful in stochastic thermodynamics and in particular in the setting of thermal anisotropy. Not only because we have a neat sort of geometric view, but also because it really opens up our toolbox to other type of tools like differential geometry, like isoprimetric inequalities, for example. So what we showed is that the, the problem of maximizing work output is really related to an isoprimetric problem, but that of maximizing efficiency is really related to finding an isoprimetric inequality in the space of thermodynamic states. So with this, we would be able to sort of have some design principles for autonomous engines. And let me just finish up with sort of things that we haven't yet tackled, which is essentially that we had to restrict ourselves to two-dimensional submanifolds. So it would be really nice if we could do this in infinite dimensional submanifolds. And also to the fact that we had to use isoperimetric inequalities that did not account for densities in these areas. So it would also be really nice if we had some results that intrinsically take into account to its densities. And this, with this, just uh, let me thank you for your attention. And I know it's late, so I'm sorry to give you all uh, so late. I also thank the team.